What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. And for those of you who are new to the channel and like car content, make sure you like and subscribe for further content. Today, we are putting my wife's engine back together, ready for her to drive the car daily again. She's gonna be so excited. All right, so I just got a phone call from the head machine shop. The heads are ready. So I'm here to pick them up here at Thornley Head Services. I've done an amazing job. I've used them before. Um, you might, guys might have seen some of their work done on the Mighty Car Mods videos. They did the head reconditioning for the Brumby as well. So if you guys need some engine machine work done, whether it's heads, they do bottom ends, they, they do engine builds, check out Thornley Head Services. Well, now that I've got the heads back, I've got the mating surface for the heads all cleaned up. Before I go and put the head gaskets on, I do need to put in these ARP head studs. Now these head studs are the ARP Custom Age 625 Plus. Um, they are a much higher tensile than the standard head bolts and even further of an upgrade to the ARP 2000s. It's gonna be a little bit overkill for this engine, but being that it's my wife's daily, I just wanna make sure that it's not going to blow a head gasket again anytime soon. Um, considering she drives it every day to and from work. So I want it to be as reliable as possible and this is going to help make that a lot more reliable. Now, if you're putting head studs into your engine, normally when you get the kit, you have some ARP fastener assembly lube. Now this stuff has to be used with it to get the proper torque that ARP specify for their head studs. Otherwise you're not gonna get the clamping force you need. Once greased up, the head studs are inserted into the block and screwed in hand tight only. The hex broach in the end of the stud is designed to assist with installing or removing the head studs from the block, not for applying torque. I do have brand new, genuine Subaru multi-layer steel head gaskets. As I said, we're not chasing power on this, it's just a daily driver, so no need to go to an aftermarket MLS head gasket, the factory one will suffice. You would think placing one of these on is self-explanatory, but believe it or not, I have actually seen people build engines at home and put the head gasket on backwards. I have actually had to repair an engine where someone has built it in their backyard and they have put the gasket on this way. So if I place this on here, okay, you can see that this oil gallery isn't completely covered. See right here, the oil gallery here is completely open and not blocked and the oil has drained out and spurted out everywhere. Now I can't even physically put this gasket over the locators. So I don't know how the person did this. With any freshly machined engine part, there's always going to be some oil from the machine shop left on there, so it's always good practice to clean it down. Once the head is on, place the washers over the studs and onto the dry, clean spot faces on the cylinder head. Then lubricate the stud threads and bottoms of the nuts with the ARP fastener assembly lubricant. Install the nuts onto the studs and then hand tighten. The bolts are then torqued up in three steps following the manufacturer's recommended torque sequence. Step one is 30 foot pound, step two is then 60 foot pound, and the third and final step is 90 foot pound. When putting together an engine, it's vital that you clean everything. So right now, before I put the cams back in and put the cam caps on, I'm gonna make sure all the surfaces are clean. There's no grit, there is no debris in any of the journals. Just make sure everything is 100% clean before assembling. Before 
Before putting the camshafts in, I will be applying some assembly lube onto all the cam bearing journals and all the valve buckets, just so there is no metal to metal contact when we first go to start this engine up. Now that this side's pretty much assembled, all we need to do is flip the motor over and do the exact same on the other side. Next up, I'm going to put the timing belt on. Now, before I am able to put the rear timing covers on and put the timing belt on, I need to fit up these oil feed hoses that go to the VVT solenoids. This one sits right here. Now, some of these have got a little filter inside of the banjo. These filters, when the car has not been serviced properly, will clog up and then cause an oil restriction which generally leads to turbo failure. It's quite common on these. What I like to do is I like to just get rid of them completely. Every engine that I've built, I've always taken them out. I've never had any dramas. So before I can put the timing belt on, obviously I need to change all the pulleys. We are putting a new timing belt kit on this. However, I do need to line the timing marks up on these two pulleys because they are under spring tension. I do have to hold them in place. Otherwise it's going to be a nightmare to line all of the timing marks up. That's where this little tool comes in handy. This locks in to the bolt and then you've got the freedom to be able to move it to get the marks all lined up and then lock them in place so everything is held in place, ready to go. And it just makes life so much easier. So if you guys are doing something like this, Company 23 do make these tools and they're quite affordable. I recommend getting one for yourself. So one cool thing to note about this engine is the black crank. Now the black crank indicates that it is a nitrated crank which is commonly found on the STIs. However, they did manage to make their way into some of the 255 engines found in the WRX. These cranks are a lot stronger and can handle a lot more horsepower than the standard silver cranks. If I was to ever build this engine to chase horsepower, I'm glad I know that I've got one of these cranks. The nice thing about genuine Subaru timing belts is they come marked with the timing marks and direction of rotation. This makes it a lot easier when it comes to installation and takes out any guessing games in making sure you have it all timed up right. Before 
before I pull the tensioner pin, I'll just show you they're all lined up. All the timing marks are all in line. Just so we know that the engine is timed correctly. And then all we do is pull the pin. Now the crank has got this, this timing belt guide on top of it. This is only on the manuals just so, to stop the belt from jumping if you do clutch start the car by any chance. Um, I have seen it happen on cars that were automatic and manual converted and this has not been put on. And someone's gone and clutch started the car and it's caused the belt to jump a couple of teeth. There is a special gapping tool to gap that properly. But a neat little trick is if you've got the box from the timing belt kit, just tear a bit of the box up, fold it in half, and feed it in there, tighten it down, and it's perfect. I like to run a thread tap through the coolant crossover mounting holes to clean out the gunk that tends to build up in. Once cleaned up, I then remove the crusty old seal and fit some nice new seals. Before I fit the crossover pipe, let's throw this busted crank breather hose in the bin and replace it with a fresh hose. then fit the exhaust manifold, up pipe and turbo before fitting the intake manifold. I do this as I find it easier to get the turbo intake lined up correctly rather than trying to fit the turbo after the intake manifold. If you've done this job before, you know what I'm talking about. All that's left is to throw some new spark plugs in and connect all the sensors. And with that guys, the engine is back together, ready to drop into the car. Now before I do, I will be changing out the rear main seal and then putting the new clutch in. But we'll save that for another video. Hope you guys have enjoyed this tutorial style video. Would you guys call it a tutorial? Let me know down in the comments. And I will catch you guys in the next one where we put the engine back in the car and get it running.